Now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, this is Lauren Wenzel, the director of the National Marine Protected Areas Center. And with me today is Cliff McCready from the National Park Service. And Cliff is going to be talking about ocean parks and the 2016 National Park Service Centennial. So I'll introduce Cliff in a minute, but I just wanted to thank our uh, partners in this webinar series, um, EVM Tools and Open Channels. Uh, we've been providing this monthly webinar series. We hope you'll continue to tune in on issues of interest and send us your ideas. Um, so we will go ahead and uh, have the webinar, and then you'll have a plenty of opportunity to provide questions and comments. Please go ahead and just type those in, and we'll have a facilitated discussion at the end of the presentation. So Cliff uh, McCready is at the National Park Service. He is the Department of the Interior Liaison for the National Marine Protected Areas Center and serves on the department's senior ocean policy team. Uh, and he, within Washington, D.C., he is the lead for the National Park Service and Coastal Resources Program on policy and communication and technical assistance to ocean and Great Lake parks. And he has devoted his career to marine conservation and environmental protection in the executive branch, Congress, and the nonprofit sector. So welcome, Cliff. It's over to you. Thank you, Lauren. So what I want to do today is give you a tour of the ocean and coastal parks and give you a glimpse at their breadth and the, their beauty and value. And I'm hoping to inspire you a little bit because I think um, all of us in some way love the ocean and, and we're practitioners in this area of, of ocean science or, or um, you know, ocean management. So I hope that you know by the end of the presentation you feel inspired to uh, join the celebration and uh, uh, it's already started. Um, so uh, with that, let's take a look at what we have in the national park system. Um, you know, Congress and the President have entrusted us with conserving some of the most spectacular places on the coast. Um, many of them include marine areas. Uh, they're fairly significant. They range from just a few hundred acres up to over a half million acres of marine waters at uh, Glacier Bay and Everglades National Park, and a wide variety of habitats. And we, um, in the system, also manage parks in uh, Lake Michigan and Lake Superior. Um, you know, the cultural landscape there includes lighthouses and shipwrecks, um, as well as at Isle Royal, which has several of those uh, well-preserved shipwrecks. There is a native population of endemic coaster brook trout, which is just one of the, you know, significant, um, you know, fish resources um, of, of many in the parks that we manage. And in Alaska and in Hawaii, um, we have uh, a range of parks. And with, you know, with over 11,000 miles of coast, I mean, you can see these are, these are spectacular shorelines. Um, but many of these parks span almost the entire coastal watershed, all the way from the headwaters of major rivers uh, to the coast. Now, while, you know, some of them may stop at mean high or at the shoreline. Um, you know, some, many of them do include marine areas, but those that don't, you know, the seabirds, the seals, the sea lions, the animals that use these shorelines for their rookeries and for their haulouts. Um, they don't care, you know. They don't care where the boundary is. So we are, uh, you know, responsible for managing these trust species in cooperation with the states and our federal partners. And then, uh, you know, the historical parks are very significant because um, they commemorate uh, the major battles in the Pacific and memorialize the sacrifice of you know, our nation's servicemen and women who fought there. And um, you know, these include, you can see in the picture, the gun emplacement on Guam, but also you know, submerged uh, sh um, 
ships such as the Arizona and um, you know, Guam and Saipan, um, the artifacts of the Japanese Navy used in these um, attacks. On um, you know, the nation's seafaring history also is a very significant part of the system. And that story is told in our maritime historic parks and forts. Um, but you know, but at the same time, this is a, a really an interesting part of the legacy that Congress and the presidents left us when they created these places, that they include these significant natural ecosystems, such as uh, salt marshes or coral reefs and seagrass beds, along with these cultural resources. So that's a responsibility to conserve both. And the national seashores as well on uh, the Atlantic and Gulf Coast, uh, as well as in uh, California at Point Reyes, they are, they are very significant because these are particularly on the Atlantic side, some of the last undeveloped areas on the seaboard uh, with barrier islands and estuaries. And they're, they're uh, not only an important place for people, as you can, you know, 18 million people per year enjoy these beaches, but they're a, they're a very important habitat and a haven for birds, fish, and sea turtles, and other important plant and animal communities. So, since the first coastal park was created, that, this is in actually predates the Park Service. It was Cabrillo National Monument in 1913 near San Diego. Um, ocean and coastal resources in the national park sy system have, have grown to 87 units with over 11,000 miles of coast and 2.5 and million acres of marine waters. As you can see, the, the geographic range goes from the Arctic latitudes to tropical bioregions in the Virgin Islands and South Florida. And um, so the diversity as well as the extent of ocean and coastal resources is quite large. And of course, it's a magnet. It's a magnet. These, many of these places are near large population centers and a magnet for people seeking that connection with nature, with the ocean you can only get at the shore. So the parks attract over 88 million visitors a year. And um, that generates $4.8 million in visitor spending. So that's an economic driver for these communities located near parks. So 99 years ago when Congress created the uh, National Park Service to uh, manage these places on behalf of the American people, it gave us a very specific statutory mandate, and it's a powerful one, to uh, conserve these places unimpaired um, for future generations. So um, you know, that mandate is, is one we translate in our daily work. And along with that is a, um, a mandate to utilize uh, the best available science in maintaining and restoring these, these parks, which is you know, a significant challenge when you're faced with a whole range of ecological stressors and threats to the integrity of ocean and coastal parks. And um, you know, the, the threats of overfishing, pollution, coastal development, and invasive species um, all exacerbate the impacts of climate change, of uh, ocean warming and acidification, sea level rise, and and storm inundation. So we're concerned about actually uh, mitigating and reducing those threats wherever they occur, 
so we can make parks more resilient to climate change. It, it's a, you know, the, the parks as as part of the landscape and the, the land sea interface with the ocean um, are great places to practice uh, ecosystem based management in the utilization of science. And um, you know that that strategy, the major goal again is to manage these stressors and try to maintain or restore the structure, function, and integrity of park ecosystems, um, both for terrestrial and marine areas, because so many of these in parks, these parks include both. So we have several programs I want to just briefly talk about. The inventory and monitoring program is a national one that it, it really just it sharpens our focus on our information needs and for obtaining the data and applying it to these problems. It's a it's a national program, but it's locally and regionally focused. And it's designed to give us that information that we need to understand the range of biota and parks and the physical resources in parks, uh, the species, the habitats, and to track their status and their trends over time th through the, the vital signs program, which is one that picks ecological indicators of condition and um, utilizes observations by the Park Service and our partners to track them over time. The inventory and monitoring networks are organized around bioregions. Um, Thirteen of those regions are located on the oceans and the Great Lakes. And then in, in my program and uh, the other programs within the Natural Resource Directorate, uh, the Coastal Geology Program, and the Climate Change Response Program. I just mentioned the inventory I and M. Um, we're we're really concerned with how we can get to the heart of what's happening now and in the future in these vulnerable areas on the coast that we manage. And water level is one of our our focus. Because the, the idea here is with all of these natural resources and vulnerable in infrastructure um, that it really just comes to light in a major way into national attention during storms like Hurricane Sandy, there are variations that of local impacts that require uh, more precision and uh, better sense of sea level and lake level at the local scale. So one of one of the things that we're we're obtaining right now is through work with the uh, NOAA and the co-ops program, um, looking at where gaps in the national network may exist in parks and actually placing instruments like you see in the one on the right to uh, monitor uh, sea level and to integrate those observations with the network so that we can get a better sense of what's going to happen in the future. Um, also, the uh, issue of vulnerability. We're, we're involved with coastal vulnerability studies, um, both nationally and in parks, to to get a sense of all right, where where will storm inundation uh, impact the resources? Um, ocean acidification is another emerging area of need for our program, and we've we've got a pilot program that um, we're working with in parks to uh, get us get observations of pH as well as the other relevant water quality parameters. Uh, fish abundance and and the impacts of fishing on the resources in parks are very are very critical to us understanding 
how uh, native populations of fish are um, are sustained over time and boundary and habitat mapping, marine acoustics. Now it's it, it, the list goes on and on. I, but these are all areas that we're where leadership and a coordination with our state and federal partners are really important. So I want to give a couple examples of where restoration has been a success. And um, the, uh, the first one is at, in the Dry Tortugas National Park, uh, which has, in that region, some of the largest and healthiest coral reefs and most productive fish spawning areas in the Florida Keys. Um, the fishes and invertebrates in these reserved reserves are carried by currents throughout South Florida. Um, and in 2007, the Research Natural Area Dry Tortugas was established um, to protect and restore these reef fish from regional declines. And it's a, um, a part of a, of, of a system that um, we, we established in collaboration with the state of Florida, but as well as with NOAA, because um, it's adjacent to the Tortugas Ecological Reserves. So in uh, 2009, we established a joint science plan with uh, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation Commission, uh, but it includes more than that. It's the, the partners in this science plan are the governmental and scientific community with scholarly interest in management responsibilities in this area. And um, it would, right from the start, there was an agreement that the research natural area, which is a no-take zone, um, needed to be founded in in a scientific evaluation of, of how effective it, how effective it is, how well it's doing over time. So um, this this plan did that and looked at several areas. And after five years of protection in both the uh, park and the research and natural area and the adjacent ecological reserves. The abundance and size of these species has increased. Um, we also discovered a spawning aggregation of mutton snapper, um, which would not have been possible without the combined efforts of the state and of the park and monitoring fish movement between the park and the adjacent reserve in Tortugas South. So um, cooperative management of the park and the Dry Tortugas region and by all the federal and state agencies was really important here. And I, I see that as, as a, a real touchstone for approaches in, in other areas where you have a, a network of marine protected areas um, unique to those resources. And that's the case in, in the Florida Keys. The Elwha River res restoration in Washington State um, was another success story in bringing back uh, the river and native populations of salmon. And there, you know, the loss of these important cultural resources, not to mention the role of salmon in nutrient cycling and in the ecosystem or their value as in the recreational fishery, uh, the loss of these resources um, has just resulted in severe impacts to the region and the river ecosystem. Um, the, uh, the dams that were created there, uh, the Elwha and the Glines Canyon Dam, resulted in severe impacts to the entire ecosystem and watershed. They just inundated the habitat and the important cultural sites of the Klallam tribe. So um, the, uh, the dam removal program was, also, was authorized in, in, uh, in the 90s, and it finally got underway 
about six years ago. And um, so both the Elwha Dam and Glines Canyon Dam have been removed. Um, and as a result, uh, the miracle of seeing adult steelhead and Chinook salmon migrating above the former sites of these dams and seeing them spawn for the first time in over 100 years is really something worth celebrating. And uh, this is, again, I think an ecological restoration story. Um, at, in Tortugas, we saw one that a, a story of how you can take a place that's in relatively good condition and maintain its, its ecological role in the region and its richness and value. And here is at the Elwha and in other places around the coast, you can see the value of restoration where everything from flood protection to sediment management, restoration of anadromous fish and revegetation of riparian areas um, is the key to bringing back a system. And uh, most of that watershed lies within the Olympic National Park. But um, we're just um, one agency, a lead agency, working with the Clallam Tribe, the City of Port Angeles, Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, USGS, and, and several other several other partners up there. Uh, so in the um, in the broader picture of how we go about a process to respond to coastal climate change, the you know it is for us a one of you know incorporating the president's executive orders and our departmental secretarial orders down to our own uh, National Park Service climate change strategy and director's orders into into action into gaining the data and information products that we need and then doing those vulnerability assessments in the parks and then throughout that entire process it's it's just very critical to bring people in and to work with all of our stakeholders but the public at large um, all the communities that are uh, affected by our, our, our proposal. And then finally to you know, develop that plan, that, that cooperative adaptation plan. Um, and this, this particular document has not been released yet, but definitely stay tuned because the, it will be coming out soon. And it will provide some examples, this coastal adaptation strategy case studies to um, to see some approaches that that have been tested in in various parks over time. So that's the what, and here's the why. Um, you know, it, our Organic Act really is very clear. It's it's we're conserving these places for current and future generations. And as the president highlighted recently, uh, these are our parks, our, our monuments, our lands, and our waters. These areas are for us. And the in our mission, we are are always keeping that that national focus that 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 these parks belong to the American people, front and center. And that's the focus of the centennial. So uh, 2016 is our 100th birthday. Um, and our mandate from our leadership is to connect with and create the next generation of park visitors, supporters, and advocates. And we're, we're in partnership with the uh, National Park Foundation. Um, and this is the website, the findyourpark.com website. And the whole Find Your Park movement is, it's a broad movement. And it's not just about parks. It's about all the, the public lands and spaces 
in the country that are managed by state, federal, local, private partners. Um, it's a the, the Find Your Park uh, story will include. There's video content, so it's there are virtual experiences in in addition to actually going to a park. We're definitely going to focus on social media, and we already are. Um, if you go to this website, you'll see Bill Nye uh, talking about climate change. There are um, other National Park Service ambassadors involved, um, both um, you know rangers as well as public figures, celebrities, and musicians and performers, all lending their own personal stories. Uh, there. Um, they're part of the campaign. Eighty percent of the families in the nation live in urban areas, according to the Kaiser Family Foundation, and sixty percent of the nation's population are in coastal counties. So what does this present? Huge opportunity. Um, many of these urban families lack access to these spaces. Um, and a big effort in the Centennial is the Every Kid in a Park program. So under that program, uh, we're, fourth graders are able to go online and get free admission to the parks and for their classrooms uh, or their, their youth groups, their, their Girl Scouts, their Boy Scouts, their clubs. Uh, for the 2015-2016 school year, so we're, the fees are waived. And then there's a grant program, and, and so in, in cases where uh, a group needs to get to a park, but they, don't, they may not have the means, they, they'll, they'll need to get a bus, they'll need to get some type of transportation to get there. There are transportation grants, and these are really focused on underserved communities to a large extent. Um, and it brings the kids in, in for service learning, to experience these places firsthand, to uh, engage with uh, the park rangers, the interpretive staff, and other volunteers, um, and, uh, and behind it is a, a a curricula that will be developed for each of these parks. And um, so as, as the year goes forward, the findyourpark.com website gives you just a, a tailor-made picture of where these events are happening just, uh, just more broadly. Um, and you can get on, get on the website put in your zip code, put in uh, a particular town or place, and you'll see centennial events listed there. And just some uh, dates to remember. Um, the Rose Parade, you don't even have to be a football football fan for this. Um, the Rose Parade has a, as its theme the Find Your Adventure. Uh, and so there's, there are going to be several floats dedicated to national parks and protected areas. Uh, the uh, uh, National Park Week in April is, um, is another uh, milestone on the calendar. And then you, if you, in that weekend, I think it's the uh, weekend of the 18th and the 19th, uh, all fees are waived to get into a park. Um, but the one that has particular um, meaning for us is the National Bio Blitz. So last year's, bi these Bio Blitzes are held every year and they bring the public, students, scientists, um, the community into a park to, uh, to discover and to document taxa uh, of all kinds, the, the biodiversity of the, those places. The one that happened last year, Hawaii Volcanoes, had more than 6,000 participants, and that's um, 
it, that's really where that's a unique celebration where the um, the bio blitz will be held on a national basis on the National Mall. So at, at Constitution Gardens, there'll be a biodiversity festival. And simultaneously, there'll be regional showcase bio blitzes in different regions of our country. Um, and many of those will be on the coast. So it's pretty exciting. Uh, there'll be hundreds of just concurrent bio blitzes happening in national parks across the United States. And then on uh, World Oceans Day, there'll be several different events happening in parks and other places. We're, we're also collaborating with uh, the National Marine Sanctuaries Foundation in, uh, in developing programs for Capitol Hill Oceans Week here in DC. And then uh, finally, uh, in, in August, we turn 100, and that, that'll be the the national birthday celebration. So I just want to end with this, you know, we're invite you to share your story and and share your your enthusiasm and and your inspiration and excitement. Go on the web and uh, uh, share those stories with us. it's it's our it's our opportunity to all celebrate a year where the special places on the coast, are, are inspiring us and inspiring future generations to conserve them. And this is, these are some of the resources that you can use uh, to get more information. And um, uh, we're going to be launching a, a, an Oceans website fairly soon, and so we can stay tuned for that. And that's it. I want to thank you all for your time and and for listening to me today. All right. Thanks very much, Cliff. So um, I would encourage you all to go ahead and submit your questions via the question interface, uh, the, the question box on the inter on the webinar interface. So please go ahead and um, questions and comments are welcome. We have one question that's come in. It's kind of specific, but um, asking why has nothing been done to eliminate the invasive sargassum weed now threatening to destroy the kelp forests of the Channel Islands? Uh, I don't know if this question is too into the weeds, so to speak. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, the, you know, the, the issue with trying to eliminate uh, that, that algae is that, um, you know, it's, as with any invasive algae, is going to be how you how you do that effectively without at, over a large area. And I'm not sure if it's the case with this particular species, but fragmentation is a problem because you can end up actually spreading it. Um, but uh, it, I think that. The park is aware of the problem, and maybe there's uh, some further information if you want to shoot me a note. Yeah, and you'll get copies of all these questions, Cliff, so if you want to follow up specifically with any speakers, that would be great. And it looks like you've got someone else here, uh, David Kushner, who's saying he's happy to discuss sargassum as well. So, okay, um, so getting to the sort of bigger picture questions. Uh, one is about um, National Park Service being waived uh, when the fees are waived for National Park Services. Does this also apply to tour fees? Uh, someone is pointing out that they went to Carl Sandburg's house and there was no entry fee, but there was a tour fee. That's a good question. I'll, I'll uh, get the answer for you. Okay. So you're, um, you're talking about in, a different, in addition to entrance fees are all the, other fees that there may be other like fees that are still applied, right? Right. Okay. Um, and here is a, a question about bioregional planning for marine regions from Bobby Reese, who asks: uh, Has bioregional planning started for your 13 marine bioregions, and is there potential for collaboration with Canada? Bioregions. So 
I suspect that um, this may be relating to MPA planning, because I know Canada is following up on that, um, and I'm getting a yes. So, um, Bobby, I think the quick answer from the MPA Center's perspective is that we don't have a national or regional scale planning process for marine protected areas. It really um, happens by the individual programs, and so it's, it's not uh, coordinated at the national or regional level the way it is in Canada. But Cliff, maybe you could just say a few words about how national parks are established. Well, you, you mean how, how they're actually founded and established? Yeah, how do, yeah. National, how, how do national parks get created? Well, you know, it's, it's really, um, it's, it's usually because there's a person or a movement in a particular place that uh, galvanize uh, the protection of that place. So, so it was Marjorie Stoneman Douglas at Everglades, for example, um, and then Congress or the President through the, the Antiquities Act will will set aside the particular park or monument, um, and it's you know the it's not you know this these these places I mean it's similar to other protected areas in that you know they're they're founded usually um, with without a regional focus without a um, now in some cases they are so with the Everglades and with the other adjacent parks like Big Cypress there is you know, a, a whole um, ecosystem focus for that park but you know, in, in some places they they're just special and they're set aside because of that and they're, and they're not necessarily integrated into any type of regional e ecosystem planning. Now that we're focused on that in our community, it's, it's happening um, in different regions of the country where um, parks are located. Uh, but at their inception, that bioregional focus uh, sometimes wasn't there. And so we're building this the, these uh, networks of protected areas, um, you know, piece by piece, and now trying to integrate them. Yeah, good point. I, I would just add um, what Cliff said about MPA networks. That that in the U.S. we're really just starting to adopt more of a network approach and see the benefits of that. And starting with the existing areas that have been established for a variety of individual reasons. Okay, here's another question about the Find Your Parks website. Someone who went on and noticed that there were some parks near them that were that were not listed, and they're asking, can can parks still be added, or is this an oversight? Are they national parks? Uh, there's the Perry's Victory International Peace Memorial on South Bass Island in Lake Erie, and the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. So it sounds like at least one of them is a national park. Uh, they both are. Yeah. Um, huh. Okay. I, I, hopefully, I mean, the you know, all of these the park sites are on the NP map system, so it's either the search that you used, or it's a problem at our end where um, the park map as a layer um, wasn't used used right. So. Maybe we can check into that. Okay. Um, I'm going to invite people to submit more questions. Uh, and uh, yeah, the Brenda, who, who submitted this question, says that she did search on the, the parks closest to her, and it sent her to the <clears throat> Ohio Erie Railroad in Illinois. So maybe that's something you guys can follow up on um, offline, whether it's a technical issue or not. So Cliff. I was wondering if you've gotten much feedback yet from the Every Kid in the Park and how that's working. I know there's been some uh, that that was launched in September this year. Is that right? That's right. Um, yeah, it, it's still pretty new. Uh, well, you know, almost two months old, I guess. Uh, but um, as far as I understand, it's it's you know the the response has been pretty strong. Um, but I, you know, maybe uh, over time we'll get a more of an evaluation of the numbers and the regional representation of of uh, you know the the schools and the groups that have been participating. 
but um, okay. Um, here's another question about Find Your Park. Lewis Gorman's asking, how do state and local entities get their locations added to Find Your Park? Uh, I'll, that's another one they'll have to pass on to the foundation and to the Centennial Office. So state and local agencies getting on Find Your Park. Okay. And it seems like another element of Find Your Park that you talked about a little bit was this um, sort of social media component and, and really an effort to reach out to younger users of the park. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? I mean, not just the kids, but um, I know that there's been some coverage about how a lot of the visitation at national parks is by older Americans and older visitors. Yeah, the, well, the, the, the major focus is again to to youth and particularly millennials so um, a lot of this is going to be driven by people themselves so just not necessarily the park, National Park Service uh, creating all the content what the Park Service will do is through these ambassadors and through just people that are visiting um, you know the websites and, and using social media to post their own content and um, and start that buzz that you know that that national conversation um, so there'll be a heavy em emphasis on that on using uh, you know Twitter um, Facebook um, the you know all of those platforms and um, you know getting getting folks to participate virtually um, in addition to you know the, the, the actual physical uh, visits to parks and just talking about outreach and, and reaching people, um, there's a question from Katie Jewett asking about um, video as a strategy on, on Find Your Parks and is curious how video is used um, to increase stakeholder engagement and whether it's used in policy making decisions or, or how you see um, video kind of being used as a tool for increasing support for national parks. Well, video is, is a very powerful medium, um, and uh, they're, we're, we're actually going to be already are using video in, um, in many parks and visitor centers, uh, and what we want to do is see it go viral because we've got great content. Um, we have you know, lots of just you know, professionals as well as people in parks, you know, using their cell phones or using whatever to to get video, and and so we want to uh, use those uh, nationally and get more exposure and and use video. But it it as far as decision making, that's a really interesting idea. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's an educational tool as well. Uh, so. Yeah, and Katie asks, do you ever watch videos in a conference room to help inform or highlight all sides of an issue before decision before officials make decisions regarding ocean policy? Ever watch video? Um, good question. I, I don't know. Um, yeah, my sense is that videos tend to be more of a story. Um, and it's not so much, and, and the, the flip side of that might be using um, video as a tool to bring people in and speak their perspective when, on policies, um, like, uh, like using teleconference for meetings and things like that. But it's, a, it's a different sort of tool, I think. Yeah, like national town halls. Yeah, the live aspect of it is, is certainly um, a real opportunity. But I think you're right. It's, uh, um, the, Video is is not so much a you know I can't point to specific examples of using video. We we are um, we, we have lots of video online, so there's lots of places where you can watch video. But as far as using it as an interactive tool, you know there that's happening more and more um, through video conferencing. So, yeah, you know I 
I also wanted to just mention, Cliff, you, you mentioned Capitol Hill Oceans Week, which is an annual event here in Washington, D.C., but Capitol Hill Oceans Week has been using a tool called Oceans Live to really reach people all across the country and around the world by broadcasting interviews with participants, and that's been a really nice, it's almost like a, a talk show just on the oceans. And so I encourage people to tune in this June um, when Capitol Hill Oceans Week rolls around and, and participate in that. Yeah. So uh, we have uh, a little bit more on outreach here. Um, someone is asking, why do you think fourth graders were targeted for every kid in a park? And was there a particular logic about that? Uh, it, it, I, I don't know the answer to that. I, my, my sense of it is that fourth graders are, are in, in that age group that uh, – where it, it it offered an opportunity to branch out beyond that age group. So if if a fourth grader is going to a park and, and or his class you know his or her classroom is going to to a park, hopefully that's you know that's an opportunity that where the um, you know that age group participates and then can be ambassadors to other age groups um, to getting them engaged as well. Uh, it might have also just been sheer practicality. I, you know, obviously they couldn't do all grades, so. Uh, but that's another one where, yeah, not being directly involved in that program, I, I can't give you the, the exact rationale behind it. Okay, and Carrie Seltzer has also written in that the National Geographic is also working closely with the Park Service and has some information on their website, uh, nationalgeographic.com slash power of parks, if people want to check that out. So switching oh, gears away from video, um, I have a question on restoration from Lisa Simons, who's asking what kinds of restoration activities are being proposed for parks in the Gulf of Mexico as part of the Deepwater Horizon proposed restoration plan? Well, there, um, there are several parks that are in the mix uh, for restoration, and you know there are different um, ways that uh, those funds are flowing to the states and to the federal government through the Restore Act and the uh, NERDA restoration funds. But um, you know that's that's another one where um, I think I should get back to you because the. You know, the some of that's still in play, so um, you know I'd want to check and make sure that um, you know those projects are are final finalized before I share that with you. Yeah, and I think the other part of that question that was submitted is how can people support um, you know park restoration as as part of these you know bigger efforts like the Deepwater Horizon process. Well. Some of the restoration that goes on in parks is is privately funded, um, so um, it it varies by park. For example, the Giacomini restoration in uh, Tomales Bay was, in large extent, uh, privately funded. Mm -hmm. So some of this is a matter of connecting with the NGOs and the foundations that are working in in particular parks. Um, there uh, and then. Are you know their friends groups in parks, and then at the national level, um, the National Park Foundation um, is supporting projects. There were centennial grants that were awarded, um, and there I'm sure there'll be future opportunities. In terms of other ways to get involved, you know, I really encourage you to volunteer. Um, you know, there. There are great volunteer programs where you can get out and and uh, donate uh, your time in, in parks. The uh, International so, Coastal Cleanup, good example. Not restoration in, in the strict sense, but definitely citizen stewardship and a you know, chance for you to go out and and support uh, a particular park. Great. And Cliff, it sounds like um, people will be able to keep up on some of these um, 
opportunities to be engaged, obviously through uh, you know social media, but also through this Oceans page that you mentioned. Do you have a sense of when that's going to be launched? I think we're looking at early spring to uh, get that get that launched publicly. Great. So that'll be that'll be a nice place for all the ocean community to go and find out more about these various activities. Yeah. Yeah, that that that'll be a major platform for the oceans in, in the centennial once when we get that going. And then some of the, some of the information is already out there. Uh, some of it's on findyourpark.com. But this will be um, the uh, the home for oceans. So, uh, you know, parks have been called America's best idea, and obviously the oceans are a uh, global resource that connect us all. And I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about how the Park Service is working across borders with other countries to protect ocean resources. Well, in different ways, in uh, different partners, we have a um, pretty extensive program with Chile. Um, we uh, sent our coastal ecologist Scott Gendy down there from uh, Glacier Bay National Park to work with the uh, Francisco de Colonani National Park on uh, whale whale issues. Um, the, the the coast of Chile is is almost in direct parallel to the the, the southeast Alaska coast and and the many of the same issues with. Uh, managing vessel traffic at Glacier Bay were similar at, at the at the park in Chile. Um, we're, we've got um, been working through the um, Cartagena Convention under the Specially Protected Areas and Wildlife Protocol um, with um, the other sites in the U.S. the sanctuaries and developing network of sites and in both for species as well as habitat management and conservation, looking at connectivity for um, terrestrial and marine species in the Caribbean. Um, there are other sister park programs. Uh, there's one at Channel Islands with um, the Isla de Guadalupe in Mexico, again because of the uh, shared uh, species that are you know, migratory species that uh, on the West Coast. Um, the, so there, there are a range of things that we're doing um, internationally um, that, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll be highlighting in the centennial. Okay. I'm going to invite anyone to have, who has any uh, final questions that they want to submit. And while you do that, I have one more question for you, Cliff, which is uh, about, uh, again, on the international front and the, the ability of the Park Service, I think, to share some of these ideas and learn from other countries. Um, I know we are hosting, the U.S. is hosting the World Conservation Congress in Hawaii in 2016, which is going to bring conservation experts from around the world to share ideas in Hawaii. And I'm just wondering what's planned for the centennial at that meeting. Um, I, I'm not sure if there's going to be a, a, a centennial focus there, uh, but I know that many of the Hawaii parks are going to be um, participating there in in the uh, both the programs and in in the Congress, um, and uh, that's those plans were were uh, coming together. And I I know that. The department was very interested in making sure that oceans and marine conservation were a part of the program. So uh, that's something that you and I, Lauren, should probably compare notes on and see where all of that stands. I'm, I'm, personally, I, I, I hope that uh, there's, a, there's a very clear focus there. Great. All right. Well, Cliff, I don't know if you have any final words you want to share as we wrap up here. Well, again, just thanks for all of you participating and I really invite you to to join us in in the centennial and to uh, you know stay in touch and and get involved it's it's everybody's party it's it's an opportunity for us to celebrate the oceans 
Great. Thank you, and thanks to everybody who participated today. And these uh, presentations will be posted on uh, open channels, the recording, and the PowerPoint will be posted on the marineprotectedareas.noaa.gov website. Thanks, everyone.